This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, November 1st edition of the DRF Players Podcast. November 1st, it's my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Uh, I'm here today, my name is Peter Thomas Fornital, and I'm here today with the usual crew uh, who involves in the New York offices of Daily Racing Forum, Mike Hogan. Hello, Pete. And coming to you from the planet Texas, but on his way to California, Jonathan Kinchin. What's going on, guys? Glad to be here. We're joined by two very special guests today, and uh, we're going to get to them straight away. It's an honor to welcome to the podcast, uh, you know him from racing coverage across the globe, probably in particular the fine work he does year in, year out for the Breeders' Cup, as well as his appearances on the great Steve Bick at the Races show, Nick Luck. Nick, what's going on and where are you? Happy birthday, Pete's mum. Uh, I, I am at Clocker Corner at Santa Anita right now. I'm oh. enjoying it very much. As always. The most appropriate place uh, in the world to be doing this show from. And then we also have, from time form, Jamie Lynch. T- uh, Jamie, how are you doing today? I'm very thanks, Peter. And I'm not coming from Clocker's Corner. I am coming from the heart of it in Yorkshire. There is a banner at York Race Course which says, Yorkshire Britain's biggest and most magnificent county. So that's where I'm from right now. I love it. I'm a big fan of York Racecourse uh, and uh, looking for an opportunity to get back there. Jamie, one little technical thing. We, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback on your end. I'm not sure if there's an obvious way for you to do this, but if you can mute your mic when you're not talking, I think uh, it might prevent some of the little bit of feedback we're getting on the show today. Okay, you are asking I told you there, Pete, but I will All right, we'll see if we can get that sorted out. We're going to dive right into these races. Uh, We want to take a look at the six races with the most participation coming from overseas. And we're going to start out with the very first race of the Breeders' Cup, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, a race, of course, where uh, foreign invaders have had abundant success. And this year, they they look poised uh, at, at a quick look of the race to have a hand as well. Nick Luck, we're going to start with you. I just wanted to ask you uh, your general thoughts on this year's running of the turf. Do you think that the the English-Irish-European uh, stranglehold on the race will continue? Are we talking the main turf here, not the juvenile turf? We're talking the main mile-and-a-half turf feed, yeah? We are talking about the Breeders' Cup juvenile turf. Oh, ju- juvenile turf. Sorry, I just missed you there. Um, do, do I think it's the strongest edition of the race ever run? No, I don't. Either side of the pond. Uh, do I think the European horses should be competitive here? Yes, I do. Uh, which of them do I think has got the best chance? And originally, I'd say uh, Intelligence Cross, though I would give Rodani some respect as well. Uh, I think you can draw a line through his last run. He was heavily eased after he stumbled, and I think he's quite a tough and interesting horse with Frankie Dottori on his back at a, at a bit of a price. Uh, but on balance, I'd say Intelligence Cross is the best of the Europeans. But uh, the, the, the bookmakers back home, and Jimmy will correct me if I'm wrong, I think they're betting about 5-2 on the field here, and I can understand why, because I, 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 don't, I, don't see, I don't see a standout contender. Jamie, we'll bring you in for your two cents on the juvenile turf. Uh, where does your analysis of the form lead you? Um, the form leads us to Lancaster Bomber. Only in can use uh, what a million dollars worth of Warfront, who's a half brother to X Celebration, as a pacemaker in these races. But that's what he's been doing. But something odd happened last time in the Dewhurst Stakes, a Group One over seven furlongs, and that was Lancaster Bomber did his pacemaking job, and then he hung around for a bit of after time and overtime, and finished second in the end. In front like that, especially even stranger things have happened since then. The fourth and fifth behind him have won Group 1 races since then. So we have to see Lancaster Bomber in a very different light. But I do agree with Nick in that Intelligence Cross seems to be the the main hope of the Euros. And he's the choice of Ryan Moore as well, which you can't overlook. And just an interesting way in with Intelligence Cross. And when we talk about the juvenile turf for the Phillies, we'll see it as well. But it, okay. up from six furlongs to a mile, and that might really help him here. 
I wanted to ask a general question about um, invaders when they come to races in the United States. How much you guys, and we'll start with you, Jamie, how much you look at the different course configurations? How, how important is it for a horse to have run around a turn before they come and face the tight turns of Santa Anita? Or is it just not something that, that factors into your analysis at this stage? I think it's it happens whether it's American racing or any racing around the world. It's very much a case of horses the most equipped the job in hand. Nick, we'll ask, on the, we're having a little bit of uh, technical issues with Jamie. I'm not sure uh, if it's just a uh, internet speed. Yeah. You know, we haven't had any uh, technical issues at all with today's show, so it wouldn't uh, it would be a bit of a surprise <laughs> if there was something else that were to have gone wrong. But Nick, maybe if you pick, we'll try Jamie again in a minute. But Nick, maybe if you pick up on that thread about how important it is uh, and and how you look at uh, form and make an uh, make an assumption about how a horse is going to adapt to USA Racing. Well, it's especially pertinent in these juvenile turf races because there's a strong likelihood that horses won't have been around a bend before. Um, some will, but quite a few won't. I, I just try and I just try and assess each horse on its merits and try and and try and and second guess, if you like, whether they're the, the sort of horse with a combination both of tactical speed and athletic agility to be able to handle the slightly different demands of of U.S. turf racing. I, 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 you don't want to get too bogged down in it, though, because I, I think especially in these two-year-old races, the horses are at such a relatively infant stage of their career that you know that an awful lot of the, the horses that run in these juvenile races at the British Cup, whether it be on dirt or turf, an awful lot of them are never going to make the grade as top-class animals. It's all about hope and potential at this stage of their careers. So I think the wheat and the chaff get separated more readily in these two-year-old races than they do in perhaps some of the races but for older horses. So therefore, whilst you're trying to second guess whether these horses will adapt to conditions, you don't want to get too bogged down in it because um, fundamental class ability numbers tend, tend to come to the fore. Excellent. All right. Well, Jonathan, why don't we have you walk us through an examination of the next race with, uh, with, with strong overseas participation, the juvenile Phillies turf, which goes as the eighth race on Friday. Yeah, the first thing I noticed when I looked down at this race after the draw was something that uh, that reminded me a lot of something last year with Hit It A Bomb. Um, and, and the two best horses, I think, from either side of the pond in Roly Poly and La Coronel have, have, have drawn what, what some would, would say is, is not the ideal spot, especially at Santa Anita, kind of a short run into that first turn. Um, there, you know, And the other thing I noticed is there's a couple of other invaders that have already run a couple races here. So does does the draw on Law Cornell and, and Roly Poly? You know, I'll start with you, Nick. Does that does that affect kind of the way you're going to view this race, or or like you said a second ago, are you just going to go with the the horses with the most ability and, and hope for the best? Well, the thing is that you, 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 your bad draw should should part compensate you in terms of the return you get on your investment. Yeah, you know, if if Roly Poly, for example, was better drawn, then you'd like to think she was going to be a she'd go off a shorter price. So, I, you know, the, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. And I, I personally think she's the likeliest winner of this race. Um, I, I like the way she finished off her race at Newmarket when um, Lady Aurelia set those insane fractions. Um, I don't think she's going to have any problem with the distance, and I've, I've sort of had her earmarked for this race for quite some time. So, I think she'd be the the strongest candidate of our group. I don't, I'd be really interested if we get Jamie back to hear what he makes of, of Hydrangea and her relative form merit to Roly Poly. Because um, it, it's a similar sort of scenario with Intelligence Cross and, and Lancaster Bomber, really. It's the, it's the horse with that sort of midsummer pace versus the, the later blooming, slightly more stamina laden type. And it, it seems that in both the juvenile races, Ryan Moore has favoured the former over the latter. Jamie, are you, are you with us to, to are we, we still got you? Can you, you still on? You're a little bit in and out, but let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Well, yeah, just to, just to take Nick's point, because it's really interesting and really significant regards the race, because Hydrangea, we know more or less her capabilities in terms of both form 
and in terms of her ability at the trip. And she's going to go forward from a low draw in that typical style with Roly Poly. We don't know how good she might be at this trip. The dam needed a mile of relish and a grace. And Paul is the who I don't think it's because. We were going so well there for a second, uh, Jamie, and then we, we, we lost it at the end. But, you know, you do make that point about Roly Poly, who also I think comes out quite well when you're looking at the, the sectional time she was able to cut out and just sort of the race flow too. last time uh, doing essentially the dirty work against lady Aurelia. Um, and and to, to, for me came out on top from those races. So I'm, I'm very much with Nick in there about, uh, about thinking she has an incredibly good chance and as impressive as La Coronel has been, uh, I'm pretty sure some of my money anyway is going to land on, uh, is going to land on roly poly. Uh, Nick, did you have any more thoughts about the juvenile fillies before we uh, before we move on? Yeah, well, I know that she no longer counts as a European runner, but we can't forget about Spainberg, who I I was really impressed with it at Newmarket. Frankie Vittori rode her in the in the Rockfall when she was trained by Xavier Thomas de Mold, who's a who's a trainer that not many people know about, but he's very capable. Um, she's switched to the Cathy Whitlow stable, and I've seen her on the track this morning. She looks great. She looks a uh, acclimated, as you would say, quite nicely, uh, and I, I think she's she's got to be a player. We know she's going to stay. We know she's good, and um, she's not she's not an ungainly filly either. I think she'd be suited well enough by the track. So I'd certainly I'd certainly stick her in the mix. I have a question, um, real quick, about times. I know in in U.S. racing we're very focused on times, and just looking at Spainberg for for instance as an example, the the, some of the races in France, even though they're at the same distance and presumably on the same kind of turf, we have firm turf, about six furlongs. There's about a six-second difference between two of her wins. Is that a factor at all, or do you just uh, focus instead on what you're seeing in the race well, replays and the, in the, in the um, time form rating? I think although we are, um, although the Europeans are a little bit ne- Neanderthal as regards times relative to, to American horse players, uh, we've got better, thanks, largely thanks to the work of people like Jamie, uh, people like Simon Rowland, people like James Willoughby, who, who sort of dragged us kicking and screaming into the into the 21st century or in, into the 20th century, probably. Um, and, and so I think you know you, you do need to take a slightly more nuanced approach to it. The thing about a lot of French races is that they run at a, a very steady pace early on, so you, your analysis needs to be based more on 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 sectional time and how fast the horse is being able to run and how fast the horse is going to be able to finish. And um, I certainly think, as you said, roly Poly's splits at, at Newmarket were good uh, relative to the way that the race was run. Um, so, yeah, you, you do look at times, but you know, just looking at it in a, in a reductive way and saying, well, this was run in a six seconds slower time. It, first of all, some of Spain's most performances came in the provinces in France, which is very difficult to assess. And secondly, some of those races are run a very pedestrian early gallop. So, um, you, know, you, you just have to you, you just have to scratch the surface a little bit and get it a little bit deeper into the into the, the finer points of it. Some folks have done some work, Mike, with uh, Google Earth and the the distances. Uh, not what you see is not necessarily what uh, what meets the eye. I think with with some of the listed distances in France. So I think that's part of it. And then uh, Nick also makes the point about the uh, about, about the the gallop and how uh, I thought it was a pretty slow gallop last time in Spainberg's race, and, and that probably contributed to. Uh, the time being maybe slightly off as well with that, that nice quickening move. Certainly the kind of thing I know, Jonathan, you look for um, when you're looking at European runners coming to the United States. Um, Jamie, I have one more thought. Um, if you have a pair of headphones nearby, I think what we're getting is some feedback from your computer sort of looping back. If you had a pair of headphones to put in, I think some of that background noise might be uh, mitigated. If you don't, don't, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can. But if you do, that was, that was the thought I had. Mike, do you want to uh, lead us through the discussion of the next uh, relevant race? Yeah, let's jump to Saturday. It's the Philly and Mare turf. Um, and of course, unlike the juvenile turf races that we've talked about, you've got horses coming over with uh, established form facing some of the best uh, of the North American runners. How do you approach races like that differently from the um, from the juvenile runs? Well, I, I just think that 
that we've just got so much more mature evidence to go on either side of the either side of the pond. I think uh, I think they're they're harder in one sense. In so far as I think with juvenile races, you can actually chuck out a lot more horses more readily. Um, what makes it harder in, in these races is obviously trying to stack up where the American fillies and theirs um, stand with their European counterparts. And also look at race standards. Look at what type of filly it's required in the past to win a race of this nature. And the answer is, you know, a pretty good one. Although the Europeans have won quite a few editions of the filly and theirs, you could actually argue that the, 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 their performance relative to expectation has possibly been a little bit below par. And it's only the very, the very, very good ones that have, that have, that have won this race. Yeah, and interestingly, I noticed that uh, Aiden O'Brien is still winless in this race, which is which was kind of surprising to me. He is, and it was actually just pointed out to me by uh, the Pete Pinkai on, on the Steve Vick show that um, that uh, found was the first female ever to win a Breeders' Cup race for Aiden O'Brien. Yeah, last year. yep, was, that's right. He's had horses run very well in it. He's had some outsiders run very well in it as well. But right, um, it's, it's probably in tandem with 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 the fact that. In the last couple of years, the fillies at Bally Doyle have really shone yeah. you know, relative to what they were doing a decade ago. He, he's, he's, he's much more filly heavy and filly and mare heavy than he, than he has been. You know, he's had some crackerjack this stuff on the turf, horses like uh, Found and Minding and, and Philly in, in here this time, Seventh Heaven, who's a, who is a real top notcher. I know, I know if Jamie gets back with us, he's got a hugely high opinion of her. And, at one point in the season, had a rated higher on time form ratings than mine. So, yeah, she's a, she's a she's a real player, seventh heaven. And you just got to chuck her last race to have to get out of it. It's just a mess. Uh, she got in a bad position, and uh, she could never really extricate herself from it. If that hasn't left its mark, and it is a big if, then she's a big player. My one slight slight doubt about seventh heaven is whether this track is going to be ideally to her liking. I think that's going to be partly offset by what's likely, and it's not always the case in this race either, what's likely to be a pretty searching pace. Um, Philly and Mare Turf has been characterized in the past by some very, very slow runnings early early in the race, um, which I think is sometimes mitigated against European runners. But I think this year the race is going to be run at a decent clip, and I think that should suit seven talent. And so I think, you know, if you're of a forgiving nature and you can forgive that last round of Haskell, and I think you can, then she's got to be right right near the top of your list. What kind of price are you looking for in a lot of these runners? That, that That's one of the biggest uh, or hardest things for me to gauge. You know, I'll know who the best North American runners are, and I, I can generally glean who the best foreign horses are. But trying to compare what kind of price I feel comfortable with, uh, that's where it becomes a little tough for me. I'd be, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm hoping if, if, if I'm going to bet seventh heaven, if I'm going to bet seventh heaven, I'm just hoping that Lady Eli just takes a huge chunk out of the market, mm. and therefore my return might be, might be more in the sort of, you know, five to two, three to one region than the than the than the six to four region. Um, I, I might, my, my guess, I, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong. My guess is that Lady Eli is just going to take a, an enormous chunk out of this market. And, and and seventh heaven is going to be a, going to give you a a return that makes a makes her a bettable proposition. I might be wrong. I may be completely wrong. I mean, you guys would know better than me. Oh, that I sounds think, very logical to yeah. me. Uh, I I think between uh, her proven excellence on the race course and all the attendant stories, Lady Eli as a as a hot favorite for this makes a lot of sense. And I could definitely see a scenario where that price on the board represents a little bit less than her chance of winning, especially when having to tangle with some serious competition, uh, not only from the North American contingent, but especially from the likes of Queen's mm-hmm. Trust and Seventh Heaven, who I could see backing both of against her if she goes off in the range of uh, six to five, seven to five. Jonathan, how hard do you think they're going to bet Lady Eli? Oh, uh, I think they're going to bet her. Um, you know, from all, all accounts, she's been working really well. So I would imagine in the DRF workout report, there's going to be some positive notes. Uh, suggesting that she's, uh, you know, she's she's ready to rock and roll. Her her run on on in this in on this turf course or a similar turf course, I guess it's different grass, but was was really impressive when she was a two year old and and uh, people like a good story and 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 I think that she'll take a lot of money. I think there's no question she'll be favored. 
How do you rate, um, in addition to, uh, do, you, do you focus at all on the other non-European foreign horses that are shipping in? We've got a couple from South America, as well as the one from Japan, trying to put all those pieces together with all the different shippers. How do you personally approach um, some of those races in, in trying to figure out where some of these other ones fit in terms of form? <laughs> <laughs> or do you just with guess? difficulty in my case? That's for sure. Yeah, with difficulty. So, somebody tells you they're an expert on on South American form, then you know, good luck. I, yeah. As far as the Japanese are concerned, I think if, it, if this had been a year ago, you'd give her a, a squeak. But I, I, I just don't think she's shown good enough form from what I can what I can see in the in the in the last few runs. Mm. Um, you know, she's a winning your in winner, and you know, she had some. She had some pretty good form with some of the best Japanese had to offer, uh, both in the early part of her career and as recently as 12 months ago. But I just, I'm just not sure she's in good enough nick at the moment and, mm-hmm. to be a serious player. Mm-hmm. Jamie, do we have you still? Are you, uh, are you still on the call? Oh, I think we may have lost Jamie for good. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the next one. Sure. You want me to pick back up again, Mike? Yeah. Go for it. It's the uh, it's the turf sprint. Well, this is an interesting uh, interesting race. It's always been my belief that the turf sprint is uh, really a specialist affair, and uh, horses with course experience, from the research I've done, and certainly in the runnings uh, that we've seen from down the hill in California, have preference for me, but. We've also never seen such a deep and interesting group of invaders. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. When, when, uh, exactly. What, what's your What's your impression, Nick? I mean, are they are these? This is a road game, obviously, to the extreme for these. But do you think the form is good enough that we have to uh, that we have to take them seriously uh, as contenders in this race? Anyway. Yeah. 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 The form's definitely good enough. Definitely good enough. Uh, the, the you know the the wacky races elements of the, of the of the hillside track here you know throws all the balls up in the air but if you just if you're just assessing it on form these europeans should be very competitive in this race i mean i sang a, a loud hallelujah when i saw the, the pre-entries for this i thought thank the lord at last at last we've the europeans have got some depth and representation here and i think that the best decision of anyone who had a double entry was Godolphin and Hugo Palmer deciding to run home of the Brave here in, instead of the mile, where I think he'd have been he'd have been a bit of a sitting duck uh, in a mile. He, he, he's the balance of his form makes him very competitive in this group, and he, he, what we know about him is that he's got plenty of a, he's got plenty of tactical speed, but he's a horse who sees out seven furlongs really well. And of course, you can get kidded at Santa Anita on this track to thinking you just need a blistering speedball for this race. Far from it. That last hundred yards, they walk, and mm-hmm. you just need a horse who's going to keep going. Uh, they, they, most of them have shot their bolt by the time they get across that across that bit of dirt track, and by the time they swing into the straight, they have completely shot their bolt. And that's going to be the case again this year because you've got those three speedsters in the inside inside gate. And if if Home of the Brave can just rate off those three and and sort of sit sit at the head of the chasing pack, then I think that puts him in a perfect position to strike because he's very game. He keeps going. I, he's not a superstar, but he's a, he's, probably a good, he's a good solid group, a group one and a half horse at home. And that should make him good enough to, 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 to make some sort of impact here. And the other, the other horses in the race are more traditional sprinters, I suppose, rather than seven fellow horses, the Swedois, Washington, D.C. But on numbers, you know, they're, They've got to be right up there as well. I just think profile-wise, run-style-wise, and ability to really see out the, the back end of this race makes, makes Home of the Brave quite an interesting runner here. I was also interested, Nick, in doing a little bit of uh, research on Home of the Brave <clears throat> that Hugo Palmer's been mentioning an overseas prize for this horse as far back as May. I mean, do we really think this might be a... Well, the Breeders' Cup meeting, anyway, was something he circled on the calendar that uh, long ago and has yeah. been pointing at since. De- is that his MO? Definitely. 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 Definitely, definitely. Particularly in the case of this trainer. He's had his, 
he brought a horse to the Breeders' Cup a couple of years ago called Acabante, who scratched late because he had a little injury that he picked up here during the week. But Hugo was here with the owner, and I, I know that just fired his, fired his desire to come back in with a horse with a chance. And he actually had three or four lined up for this meet, but this is the one that survived the season the best to get here. Um, but actually, it's an interesting point. Eight out of the 12 European based trainers who are at Santa Anita this year are first timers at the Breeders' Cup, which and I think that is hugely encouraging. Hugely encouraging. Obviously, Aidan O'Brien is going to dominate the column inches and, and he's got huge representation. We're in danger of sort of, of not tipping our hat to all the trainers with slightly less powerful strings who've, who've, who've got on the plane. You know, eight out of 12 first timers, which is, which is great. And a lot of young trainers too. And, and you know, horse players all around the world will be fairly familiar with the fact that Hugo Farmer has made one of the most striking and rapid ascents uh, of, of any trainer. You know, in, in in recent years, he's a classic, he's a dual classic winning trainer now, um, and it's certainly within his a, a, a ability range to produce a horse to win a Breeders' Cup race. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, so, yeah, I think he's he's had this it's a long-winded answer to your very simple question. Yes, I think he's had this marked out for quite some time. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about trying to separate Washington D.C. and Suedois, who are. Uh, ranked, uh, looks like they're ranked very similarly, but seem to have different attributes. Yeah. On one hand, Washington, D.C., with the, the excelling going much shorter, Sudwa's seeming to uh, potentially handle this six and a half that, as you pointed out, can sometimes play like a tiring mile. But then I also noticed that Washington, D.C. does have some, uh, some left-handed success. Um, how do you separate these two contenders? Uh, they are quite hard to split on form, in truth. I think I think there's a case on their European efforts that Swed was a slightly more bankable and reliable animal. But having said that, Washington DC's got quite a bit of talent, and I just wonder whether whether a collapsing race might suit him. You know, he is an infrequent winner, and whether whether he's the sort of horse that just needs the but but he's got talent. Whether he's just the sort of horse that needs the race to collapse around him is quite an interesting an interesting possibility. Um, I, I wouldn't fall off my chair if Washington DC ran a big race, but by the same token, he's not a horse whose overall profile has you rushing to the windows. All right. Shall we move on? Uh, Jonathan, you want to lead the next discussion? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to go on to the turf, uh, the big turf. Um, you know, looking at this race, I, I was I was bummed out initially when I heard that Fallon wasn't going to run because I wanted to be against her and I wanted her to take money. And I, I wanted to start there, I think, Nick, with, with your opinion. Um, you know, I, I don't follow European racing as much. I'm, I'm pretty busy with the American racing. But I, I did remember hearing uh, on Champions Day uh, someone say that, that Found is more of, the, of a grinding type. Stamina is – is obviously her best attribute. How do you think that's going to translate to the turf course at Santa Anita? Um, and am I crazy when I say that that it's Highland Real is the one that I want over found? Um, I don't think you're crazy, but unoriginal though it sounds, and you know, I I like a bit of counterintuition as much as the next man. I just can't see any. I can't see a really good reason why found isn't going to win, and you know she's. She's two to one in the in the domestic books or thereabouts, and I think that's a pretty decent price for for the for the horse who won the race last year and be a good horse in Golden Horn. For a horse who's won the arc, has proven last year that she can go bang 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 in three of the world's biggest races and take it. For a filly who is unarguably in better form coming into this race now than she was this time twelve months ago, I think that is a if that's the if that's the, the dividend that she returns or thereabouts, and I'm not sure that it will be because Breeders' Cup players do love a returning hero or heroine, then I think she's a perfectly legitimate play. I, I don't see any Highland Reels an admirable horse. He really is. He's an admirable horse. He can take the travelling. He can take races in any part of the world. He drubbed Flincher in Hong Kong at the back end of last year. He lost the like about him. I don't see any obvious reason why he should reverse the form from the arc in truth. And the other point about found is she finishes second a lot. And that, that is a stick that is frequently used to beat her. But she's one where it's mattered most, Breeders' Cup turf and the arc. 
And both of those races are, uh, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's amazing how this can get lost in the fog. Both of those races are run at a mile and a half. And she, for me, is just an out-and-out mile-and-a-half filly. And it's only her class and her guts that's managed to see her run so many good races against slightly faster horses like Almanzor at 10 furlong. Um, Found, the latter part of this season, has been a completely different beast to Found in the early part of this season. I think that midsummer break just revitalized her. She looks different physically. She just looks a much better better model physically in the latter part of the season. I'll be, I haven't seen her yet because she's still in quarantine, but I'll be interested to see how she looks when she comes out on the track tomorrow. Um, I, 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 I cannot see any obvious reason to oppose her unless she finds the surface a little bit too quick, and that would be the only slight reservation I have. But as Aidan O'Brien has pointed out umpteen times, most of these Galileos love fast ground, and they will run through a brick wall for you. Now, with, with your experience getting to know Flincher as a you know as a, as a younger horse, um, and and you know us kind of getting to know him a little bit better this year. I mean, we obviously he's been coming over, but him being here kind of full time for the year. What, what was your assessment? Uh, of what happened October first at Belmont when when he when he lost to Ecto, what, what was your what was your take on the race? Was it the ground? Uh, were we fooled? What, what do you think? What, what do you think happened there? I might have changed my mind about Flincher and his prospects in this race about fifty two times in the last <laughs> six weeks or so. Uh, I've contradicted myself on just about every available platform. So apologies if I do so again. But here's where I'm at with him now. I. I I think we just all got sucked into thinking that that he was an absolute superstar in the early part of this season and that he'd, he'd in some way stepped up on what was a, already a really high level of form in Europe. And just on reflection, I'm just not sure that's the case. I just think he was beating up bad horses in hand, doing so impressively, but in hand. Now, the, the run last time, the ground is a, a clearly an issue. He can't go on soft ground, which is why he came to America in the first place. But the run prior to that, where the controversial race where he, he got left the inside by his bunny, um, I didn't actually think he was that impressive. And I think that even that form needs a bit of improvement on. You know, I think he needs to I think he needs to be in the sort of form that he was in when he was posting some of his very, very best efforts in Europe, i.e. his arc second, to be winning this race. And I'm not sure at this stage of his career whether he remains capable of doing that. Um, the other point to make about the race at Belmont Park is that Ecto's a pretty good horse. Now, all it really told us was that Ecto's well-being was intact. But if you, if you look back through his early French form, both at the back end of his two-year-old career and, and uh, in his sort of abridged three-year-old campaign, he put up a couple of really, really impressive displays, one in an art trial and once when he beat Caraconti in a mile race at two. So he is a horse of, of top-level caliber if they've you know, ironed out the, the creases that saw him have such a disastrous campaign in 2015. But he's a horse I'd... I'm, I'd I'm slight. I'm slightly wary of, of, of Ecto. I think he could be a player in this race. I'd be. I'd be. I'd be loath to completely kick that uh, that Belmont win into the long grass as regards of, 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 of a valid piece of, of form, or at least a valid piece of evidence as to his well-being. Um, if that makes any sense, I think. I think what you can get out of that is I'm a little bit anti-Flincher in this year's race. I have one more question, Nick, for you about Found. Does the flirtation with the classic give you any pause? It just seemed weird to me that that was the stated plan and then pulled back. It makes me wonder if there was some sort of reason for that decision, but but I could just be overthinking it as we tend to do sometimes with these uh, Breeders' Cup races. Maybe. I mean, I couldn't say you're wrong. I couldn't say you're wrong. <laughs> My reading of it, apologies, <clears throat> would be that they quite wanted to have a go at the classic, and it, it's habitual for Aidan O'Brien and the Cornwall guys to see their their most high profile, in the spotlight, in form, you know, older horse in that or three or whatever in that race, and to have a go at it. You know, it's an unrequited, an unrequited love for the classic for Aidan O'Brien. You know, dating back to to that narrow defeat uh, of Giants Causeway. It's a race he desperately, desperately, desperately wants to win. But I think in the cold light of day. There's classics and there's classics, you know. If it was 
Fort Larned Mucho Macho Man and whatever, then fine. <laughs> but it's not. It's California Chrome in his backyard, Arrogate, Frosted, if you like him. And, and you know, two or three other sort of pretty hard-knocking horses that do the winning. And, you know, as, as Jamie and others have pointed out in terms of figures, figures alone, if, if Found had run in that race, even if she'd adapted to the surface, which sire statistics tell you would have been unlikely, then she'd have had a hell of a lot on her plate, even with the Phillies allowance and even with her toughness. So I think it's the, it's the sensible move to go for the turf. Whether, as you suggest, it might be an indication that she's not absolutely firing is, is, is possible, but I don't know. That's, a, it's, that's pure guessology. Before we leave the turf, Nick, I, I can't let you get away without getting your opinion on Ulysses, who I happen to think is a very interesting mm. runner for a trainer who's had a ton of success in this event. Seems yeah. uh, unexposed, yeah. progressive. Um, but it, d- is it a bridge too far with those other serious Euros in this race, or, or might I, I be on to something at taking a shot I, at 10 to 1 or higher? This is, this is it. It, 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 it you, you've absolutely hit the nail on it. It's a hunch play, isn't it, really? It's a hunch play. Um, and it's based on a couple of things. It's based on, well, it's based on more than a couple. It's based on three or four things. First of all, the trainer, as you point out, so Michael Stout, great record in the race, and not a man to sort of spray entries around like this sort of liberally. He doesn't, he doesn't kind of dive into races like this with horses that haven't got any shot. Uh, second, the pedigree by Galileo out of the Oaks when a light shift means that she bred to be a very good filly and, and when she, where the, he bred to be a very good colt and before he ran in the derby off the back of a maiden win. So Michael Stout was being very, very unstout like in his bullishness. Now, he was biting off more than he could chew at that early stage of his career, but he's come back and run, I thought, a really, really impressive race at Goodwood or be in lesser company. And then he was beaten in a, in a race at Windsor last time. But um, he, he's the sort of horse, it, it is a bit of a hunch play. It's, an, it's a feel, it's an impression thing. He's got to improve on form, for sure. But there's, there's lots of reasons to think, nah, you know, he's fresher horse than most. Some of them come at the end of the season. He's quite a handy horse. He's not over big. Track might suit him. When they'll go on the ground, the trainers, you know, the trainer's a past master at delivering these horses right for the right day. So, you know, yeah, I get it. I get it. If, you, if you've got a hunch for him, if you've got a strong feeling for him, he's just one of those sneaky horses that could be peaking at the right time. All right, Nick, let's, uh, let's move on to the last of the turf races on Saturday. That's the mile. And, boy, what a, what a race this is. Uh, in addition to Teppan, of course, and um, Miss Temple City, you've got uh, Ironicus, uh, for the North Americans, and then you've got quite a few of the Europeans who look to be big players in here. Uh, and uh, we, we talked about Aiden O'Brien in the um, in the Philly and Mare turf. Uh, he's actually winless in the mile as well. He's 0 for 14 in the mile, but he's got um, a couple of good chances in here. What, who do you rank as the best of the European runners, and do you think they're good enough to beat uh, the best of the U.S. ones? Uh, who do I rank as the best of the European runners? Limato. I think he is the best horse uh, from Europe in the race in terms of pure ability. Um, dare I say it, I think there's a case to be made that he's he's a notch superior to Tepin, even on class. Or, or on what they've shown, so, sorry, on what they've shown this season. I think he used to make a, a really cogent case that he's, he's a, he, he comes into the race in better form than she does. Um, the big question is, first time in America, clearly, mm-hmm. and he's winless at a mile. He's winless at a mile, which is which is why American horse players, sensibly enough, are going to be slightly sceptical. But as I've said pretty much everywhere else, and I'll say it again, his one run at a mile, A, it wasn't that bad, B, it was in top company, and C, it was straight, a straight mile, which is obviously more exciting stamina-wise. D, his trainer couldn't buy a winner at the time and it had been in much better form subsequently. And it was the first time the jockey had ridden it. So there's, there's loads and loads of reasons to suggest that that shouldn't be taken as conclusive evidence that he won't stay this distance. Um, he's not a very big horse. He's handy. He's a lot of tactical speed. It's a big, big challenge for his jockey, but his jockey's a cool headed, impressive young guy who really thinks about the game. And if he can, navigate his way to a good slot from stall 10 
then then he's a huge, he's got to be a huge player. He's got to be a huge player. Do you have any concern, or, or does it give you pause? Kind of the similar question that Pete asked about found in in vacillating between the classic and the turf. I know for a little while they were possibly thinking the turf sprint for Lamato before deciding on the mile. Um, does that concern you at all, or um, you just think he's the best one in here? Not, not really, because I think he's a good enough horse to be in this race, and this is the better of the two races. So he should be the best horses should be in the best races, and I think that's. I, I think I, I think they were they were deterred by the by the sort of um, eccentric nature of the of the turf sprint. For my own part, I think if he'd run in the turf sprint, he the others may as well start now because I think he'd have I think he'd have he'd have walked the floor with them. But mm-hmm. it, it, it's I think it's it's right it, it, it's right that he should be in this race um, because he's got a good shot of of, of winning it. I mean, I, I couldn't. I couldn't be massively confident about his chance just because it's such a deep group of horses and there's so many imponderables to, uh, to, to bring into play as regards how the race is going to, to, to stack up. It's one of the most fascinating mm-hmm. Breeders' Cup races I can remember. It, it, it's just, it, it's, it's got so many crazy elements to it beyond Pepin, beyond Lenato. It, it, it's just got a great shape to the race. It, it really has. But he's a, if you're asking me in terms of pure ability, which is the best of the Europeans, it is him. Which which horse has the ability to quicken? If Jonathan wants a quickener, he can quicken. He can quicken on a sixpence. But the only difference is at a mile, that that just that that slightly dull. You know, if it's a really strongly run mile, that's going to slightly blunt that weapon. That weapon becomes less potent. Um, and then and, and you need you need a, a galloping miler rather than a quick. And that's when you get a horse like Alice Springs rolled into the mix. My, my issue with her, I don't, I don't have an issue with her. She's an admirable filly. She's, 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 she's a cracking filly and she's got a decent chance. But all her great one wins have been against fillies only. So is she up to taking on good Colts as well as America's, one of America's best fillies? Yeah, and, uh, you know, she's getting weight. So uh, perhaps that helps a little bit. Um, do you think, uh, in terms of pace now, you know, of course, photo call ran off, uh, and, and perhaps that was the excuse for Teppen in the last out. Do you think that the likely pace scenario, uh, helps you upgrade or downgrade certain runners, um, compared to some of the previous efforts? Uh, yeah, I, I think if, if, if the pace is, if the pace is really hot end to end contested, and they don't let up. But I, I would think that would bring Alice Springs more into it, and it might it might count a little bit against Lamato. I mean, stress in this race when I I, I, I think it is the hardest race to have mm-hmm. real conviction about what's going what's going to unfold. Yeah, because everybody wants to talk about it. It'll be it'll be the race where people express the strongest and most dogmatic opinion. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can go in here. I mean, it's not like uh, Teppen is a single move on. It's, this, isn't, this isn't last year. As good as she is, and she may be as good as she was last year, this is a really, really tough field. But, you know, this is one of those races where the draw the draw makes the difference to me. And this is if, if this is a race on a Wednesday or a Thursday at, at Santa Anita or Belmont, they are going to absolutely fly. The three fastest horses in the race are drawn on the rail, the far outside, and in the middle, uh-huh. and, and 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 I don't care if one of them misses the break; they have to fly in this mm-hmm. race. And and I think because of that, right. uh, Aronicus makes a ton of sense. I, I worry that he's going to be overbet as a yeah. wise guy horse off of his last run. But uh, you know, the the Nick's information about Alice Springs being more of that kind of galloping mile or finishing is one that that, that has caught my attention. Yeah, I I I. I, I... I certainly see Alice Springs being being there, you know, keep running running at the end of the race rather than faltering at the end of the race. You know that, and that's that's got to be in her favour. It's just a question of whether she's quite quite good enough. But she is a listen. She is a three time Group One winner this season alone. So you know, she's uh, she deserves to take a chance. And her most impressive performance is when she went around a left hand bend as well. She was arguably more impressive there than she was by the time she won on a straight track. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot there's a lot to like about it. Yeah, and um, I felt I felt adding you know, to Alice's. Oh, sorry, Nick. 
just going to mention that added no, to her appeal was the idea that, uh, you know, I don't think she loved the ground at Keeneland, still ran very well in that race, it was a little soft for her, and also didn't have the easiest of trips there, was stuck in a vice for, for part of that run. I, I definitely take your point about her being behind Lovato on form, but if the prices are right, uh, I, I could definitely see Alice Springs getting some of my money. Do, what about the, the, the outsiders coming over from uh, – from overseas do you do you give them any chance maybe for uh each way or the lower runs of the exotics or, or do you think we've we've hit on the relevant runners so far well run, get, you run through them and I'll, t- I'll i'll tell you what i think dutch connection um the sort of horse that should be suited by american racing okay he's run a keener last year but the ground was too soft for him he likes fast ground he's a kind of he's a sort of seven furlong mile rather than a staying miler uh, but the the, 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 um, the I think the, the dimensions of the track are going to suit him well. He's a he's not, not impossible, but he's not predictable. Uh, let's see who else we have. Spectre. Did, have you done any research on this? Uh, to be uh, honest, Marcus Monk runner. Uh, some of the some of the some of the form is entitled Spectre to be here, but um, uh, I think probably up against it. And then there's another. Uh, oh, there's two more, right? Uh, we have uh, we have Cougar Mountain from the O'Brien team. Magnificent, magnificent looking animal, and a real, but quite a mercurial character. Uh, quite impressive when he won that Group Two at Newmarket. Um, but on all known evidence, if this is if this is supposed to be one of the the great Breeders' Cup events, you're going to be a, you'd be a bit disappointed if he was good enough to win it. And then we have another, uh, the, the, the hero from the juvenile turf last year has had a bit of a star-crossed season in, in Hit at a Bomb, who uh, certainly looks uh, a bit overmatched oh. on his recent form. C- could you see a wake-up call coming back to American racing for the son of Warfront? Well, if, you, if, a, if, if the wake-up call is called Lasix, possibly. <laughs> um, uh, but that's the, that, 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 I mean, that's the only angle I can really think of. Um, I, I, the, the ground should suit him. We know he goes well on an American track. It was a great performance last year. I thought he was brewing towards doing something, but he brewed towards doing something rather unspectacular at Ascot last time. So I'm, I think, you know, it's like you can make bits and pieces of cases for all these sources, but it, 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 when push comes to shove, it's a, it's a serious, serious race. And I think it's going to have to take a serious horse and a horse that's in a bit of form to win it. All right, feet to your fire time, Nick. At the uh, just you know approximately at current prices you've seen around. Do you is there a bet at this meeting that you'd be uh, you definitely would want to make at this point? We talked a little bit earlier about the turf, and I think the trouble is I I I don't think that found here will return the sort of dividend that it might might be predicted by the price she is with bookmakers in Europe, in, in England, sorry. Um, so, you know, if, if, I th- if I thought she was going to return bigger than two to one, I think I'd want to make her, make her a decent bet. I just don't see any reason why she shouldn't win again. But you talked about Ulysses, and if you're talking about a hunch play, I think he's quite, he, he's quite an interesting runner. He, he, you talked about wise guy horse, like ironically, he, he could be a bit of a wise guy horse, but I think I'm sure there's, there's lots of reasons if you if, if you're going to get a d- big double figure return, then I think he's a he's a, a very interesting runner um, in that. I'd certainly be using him in in exotics and so forth. Um, as far as the juvenile races are concerned, I think I think Roly Poly has to be a big big player in the in the juvenile fillies, um, and I'd certainly be looking to bet her. Um, I really like to think Home of the Brave can run a bold race in the turf sprint. It, it's contingent on him not getting involved in that in that early speed. I think I know he's a, he's a natural front runner, but I think he's just got to be allowed to settle into his own rhythm rather than trying to run, you know, insane, insane early fractions. I don't know whether he's quite tractable for that. I hope he is. If he is, then I think he's a horse that that I'd be very interested in. And we we didn't give Queen's Trust much love in the filly and mare turf, and uh, she's. She's not had as heavy a campaign as some, and she's really not got that much to find with Seventh Heaven. 
So I, I and she'll she'll like the surface. So I, I think she's a an interesting runner. Um, I could go on, but I, I won't. <laughs> That's fantastic stuff. Uh, We've kept you over time, Nick, but I, if you don't mind, we'll each ask you one final question, then we'll let you get on with your day. Uh, Mike, you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask of any of the turf races with uh, European shippers. Are there any that you feel uh, the Europeans are maybe uh, up against it versus the American runners? Or well, do you I think always, do you think, think we might have a thing. sweep? <laughs> I I think I think as it should be, all these races are going to have to be you know hard won. I I, I don't. Listen, I, I, I think I'd be a little disappointed if, if a European horse didn't win the turf, didn't win main turf. I think that would represent like significant underperformance from a lot of horses, you know. But mm-hmm. the, I, I, I've lost count of the amount of times we've had a stack of fancy runners in the mile and none of them have shown up. You know, I know that there's been some wonderful winners of the race from Europe, you know, the, 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 the Goldacovas and the Miesks and what have you, but... You know, that is a hard, hard, hard race to win. You know, no matter how good your horse is, and no matter what sort of form you come into the race, I, I don't think the gimme, I don't think the juvenile turf races are a gimme because whilst I, you know, I, I made a strong claim for the likes of Rowley's body, it's not like we've got masses of depth in there. You're, you're you're pinning your hopes on one or two horses, and then there's you know ten or eleven decent American horses taking you on. So you know, if you're asking me if I think. It's, it's a Breeders' Cup. The, the races should be hard one. There shouldn't be anything handed on a plate. You know, however many surf races you put on. Um, and yeah, I think I think if, if if the Europeans come away with with say three winners, I, I count that as a good return. Jonathan, you got one more for Nick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we've been lucky to hear Nick's opinion about uh, the European horses, but, uh, I know Nick follows American racing en- enough to, to give us, uh, uh, an American horse that you're excited about betting someone you've seen maybe work while you've been out at Clocker's corner or, or just someone you've seen, uh, doing your NBC work, uh, either at Santa Anita or, or out at Keeneland. Uh, I think, I, I, I do think Gormley is going to run a really big race in the, in the, in the juvenile. Um, I know Clint was a little bit unlucky last time and missed the break, but, um, Matt Bonier was massively keen on Gormley going into the into the front runner, and he was proved spot on. He just said horses from this stable just don't do what he did on his debut. And that's right. I think I I I think he's I think he's an absolutely completely logical play. Admittedly, in what looks a very good running of the juvenile, and uh, however good the East Coast horses are and have shown, and I thought that Syndergaard's effort in defeat at Belmont was heroic. Um, but, it's just so often they come and get, and get piled in going, going that sort of different West coast rhythm in, 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 in the Breeders' Cup run at Santa Anita. So I think Gordon leaves a, a very sound play in the juvenile and, you know, call me very boring, but um, it really is hard not to be taken by arrogate when you see him. He's just such a physically imposing beast. He's the sort of, he's the, he's the purest horse in some ways, isn't he? In the, in the classic, he's got the pedigree for it. He's, you've got the physique. You've got it, that spectacular performance at, at Saratoga. And of course he's got half of the world believing that that was either an aberration, a fluke or something that can't be repeated. And the other half thinking that it was the real deal. And I think I'm, I'm edging towards the latter point of view, really. Be interesting to see those uh, pink and green silks in the Breeders' Cup classic <laughs> winner circle, a steep, task ahead of him though of course with 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 chrome in there but uh gonna be a heck of a race gonna be a great meeting my last question for you nick is is simple where can folks uh, find you and continue to follow your coverage uh this week and, and maybe uh through social media as well yeah well um I'm, i i try and do my bit on uh on twitter when time allows so i'm at nick luck on on twitter nice and simple nice easy one i'm sure i will be uh will be seconded to a few more uh a few more slots with my good friend, Mr. Steve Vick, uh, on, uh, on his Sirius XM at the racing show. And obviously the, uh, the main event, uh, I'll be uh, joining the guys at NBC, great team. Um, we have got a handicapping show, which goes out on NBC SN, which we're taping tomorrow, which will be shown Thursday and then before racing on Friday and before racing on Saturday. And then, uh, all the races on NBC SN Friday and then Saturday and the classic show on NBC in primetime. 
Um, you'll have to, I, I don't know the exact timings, but uh, that's where I will be popping up for the remainder of the week. Well, thank you so much for taking an hour out of a really busy week to join us and share your thoughts here today. We're going to have more coverage. Mike Hogan, uh, give folks a, a quick rundown of what else we've got on DRF.com in terms of Breeders' Cup coverage over the next couple of days. Well, if you're listening to this live, you should join us at 2 p.m. Eastern time for a live handicapping session with uh, Andy Beyer and Steve Davidowitz. That will be fantastic. Tomorrow morning, uh, we do another one of these at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time. Uh, Pete Jonathan and I will be joined by Matt Bernier. In the afternoon, we've got two sessions, uh, webinars, if you will. Uh, the first one being at uh, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Mike Watchmaker and Randy Moss. Uh, and then 4 p.m. Eastern Time with Mike Beer and Dan Ilman. Uh, and then fr- uh, Thursday, sorry, we, we culminate with uh, uh, Matt, Matt Bernier. Bernier show. Exactly, the Matt Bernier show in the morning where Jonathan, Pete, and I will join him. And in the afternoon, Jay Privman and Mike Veshi look at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, should be a lot of fun and a lot of great information. I'm also sorry. The only thing I'm sorry about this show is we didn't get uh, Jamie Lynch's full participation. But folks who are interested in what he has to say about the Breeders' Cup, you can order a product he's worked on for Time Form USA through the Daily Racing Form site. You can find it in the DRF store. Uh, Mike, do you, do you remember the URL offhand where people can go uh, and buy that through us? I do. It's drf.com slash BC package, all one word. Very curious to get the rest of his thoughts, and we'll make sure to have him back on soon. I want to thank Nick Luck. I want to thank uh, Jamie. I want to thank Jonathan Kinchin, Mike Hogan. Most of all, all of you for listening. It's going to be a big week here on DRF.com. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital, and I hope you win all your photos.